when I was in my, I, I guess I was, I was 20 years old. I just turned 20 and I was living in the Netherlands and not taking care of myself at all. I was having fun. I was partying. I was not thinking about my future. I was just, I knew I was going to go learn Mandarin and teach English in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. That that's as that's the extent of my goals at the time. And by the end of that year, I I had a flu that never went away. Um, a, this low grade fever. My face turned purple. Every time I'd wake up, my face was purple, like a blueberry and sometimes my whole chest. And I had welts in my throat and things just started to deteriorate really quickly. So I came back to Canada. I did all sorts of tests. Um, I was tested for HIV multiple times because they're just like this one white blood cell, your CD57, it's very low. That's basically a, a symptom of eight HIV or Lyme. And the Lyme test came back negative at first. So they kept testing me for this. And I had inconclusive lupus, MS, ALS, trying to diagnose me with all these different things because I had all these symptoms and it just got worse and worse over the next two years. So for two years, I didn't know what was going on. And it was to the point where I moved back in with my folks after university and I was bedridden. There was at least a week in there where going to the bathroom was hard. But other than that, I just laid in bed. My digestive system, I don't know what happened. It just stopped working. And, um, and it was actually so difficult to eat that I stopped eating. And I started a juice fast and gained weight from that because that was more calories than I was getting. So I, I, this, I, this was like a 180 flip in my life where I didn't care about my health at all to, I was on a mission to figure out what was wrong. And I did, I got the Lyme disease diagnosis and, and then I just, my, my whole life became about trying to figure out how to get into remission basically. And I tried all the, these things that doctors recommended or that they didn't recommend, uh, just alternative therapies that I was finding through these forums on the internet. And I met all sorts of people with Lyme disease through different clinics that I went to. And some of them were in treatment for years. There was this beautiful, probably 30 year old woman who was always at this clinic and she would wear big sunglasses. And she was, at first I felt very unapproachable just like gorgeous, not smiling, big sunglasses inside. And, and then I found out she had Bell's palsy and she just wanted to cover it up. And this is years after having a pick line and eating a very limited diet, trying, trying all the things, um, the things that she thought would, would help her get better. So I spent four years, long story short, I spent four years, uh, experimenting with my health and being a guinea pig and and really uh, taking it slow. And I have a friend who had leukemia twice. He's a, a cop and a dad now. And we joke about how at the time when we were sick, we were more Zen people because you have to wake up and smell the flowers and acknowledge your mortality versus when you just, you're you, health is okay, even if it's mediocre, you wake up, you look at the clock and you go to work and it's very easy to take things for granted. So at this time, even though I had always wanted to write fiction and, and comedy, uh, I was just obsessed with getting better. And I was on all sorts of blogs and reading all sorts of books. Even my, my camera right now is stacked on top of a bunch of books um, on Lyme disease, anatomy, <laughs> applied psychology, and, and just bereavement, all these things that I got into at that time in my life where I was facing my mortality and, and trying to write a good book as well. So it was a long journey, 
I've balanced out a little bit now. I'm not so I'm not so obsessed with doing the right thing for my health. But back then I I was I try not to eat too many carrots so I didn't overdose on sugar. Now I'll eat a chocolate bar every every single day. I'm eating Hagen dazs tubs of ice cream, just the full tub <laughs> before before I go to bed. Uh, right now, I'm I'm pregnant. It's blame blame the baby, um, but it it's also it feels like a dream. Honestly, like talking about it now, um, it's good to talk about because it's been so long. But it's because it's been so long. It, it just feels like I was a, a different person, and makes me feel really old because life is long and. And so much has happened since then. It's it's an incredible story, Jess, because you you were fighting Lyme disease before people really knew what it was. And um, at what like what was your trigger point? Like you you were on this health journey. When did you think, oh my gosh, I have to write a book? Like when did the blogging turn into a book? It was probably three years in, three years into treatment when I realized that I was not just doing better, but I was healthier than I had ever been. I was, you know, I I, I was a party girl in university and, and high school. In elementary school, I was a pretty fat kid. I was second last in track and field without fail wakey I won't say her last name but if I could just beat wakey <laughs> I was happy um and after just being so dedicated to taking my 60 supplements a day and doing my IV treatments and and seeing all these different doctors try to figure out how to balance multiple systems so the book's called it's not just Lyme because I was doing so much blood work my reproductive health my lymphatic system my thyroid I wanted everything I was working on everything at once um so what was what was the question it was it was just like what what at what point were you like oh my the god trigger I have to write right the book. yeah your trigger right so <laughs> sorry about that no uh, so no, no. I so after finally caring about my my body I was healthier than ever I went from you know being bedridden to walking around my kitchen island my parents kitchen island because I'd moved back home to taking my dog for walks to weight training to rock climbing five days a week and I had never been so fit in my life and and I had developed food phobias while I was sick because with Lyme disease there there's a lot of theories about food especially sugar um feeding the bugs so to speak so suddenly I was more in shape I was aggressively like weight training rock climbing so I needed sugar which I loved because I, I mean, who doesn't love food and sugar um, or, or carbs? No, I wasn't just pounding re refined sugar, but uh, just feeling healthier than I'd ever been and being surrounded by other people with Lyme disease who were at this for much longer uh, made me feel like I had something, something to say because I wasn't uh, following typical advice. I had avoided the traditional, like, take antibiotics um, and just hope you you kill the bugs uh, school of thought. And I took the scenic route and ended up taking so many supplements. I was on 60 pills a day, but I was trying to take a really natural approach. Uh, food was important to me, sleep laughter and sun very simple things um so i wanted to to talk about that uh, because there's, there's so many aggressive treatments for lyme disease and so much fear with food and with taking the wrong steps and with not taking antibiotics 
fast enough. And by the way, if if some if I knew someone who got bit by a tick uh, and found out about it within a month, I'd say, yeah, take take the antibiotics. But for people ten years later, um, you know, five years later, like me, two years later, I I felt like just seeing the people around me, um, I wanted to try this other approach. I was really scared of food, but also what would happen if the antibiotics biotics didn't work. So I took it really, really slow. And the book is sort of about my turtle pace getting into remission. Oh, and it's also about the nuance of it. So I talk about pros and cons of antibiotics and of different all these different diets. Um, so going back to my pet peeve of things being black and white, uh, that's where I really got to address that. And when you started writing Jess, how long did it take you to um, to write your book? Um, I have no idea. I was blogging for a year and then I kind of took my blog posts and smacked them together in an order that made sense and and polished it up so that it flowed better. But the book the book did not take a long time because I had been writing for a year. Probably three months from you know, from the time I put it together got it edited not by like a professional like like you but um, but I think I had a light copy line edits and proofread before publication yeah and Jess can you walk us through because I know that the editors group is interested your decision of how, who you went with to get published and what process you went through um I didn't think much about this back then, and I'm not sure if I'd make the same decision now, but I just went with Amazon and self-published. And my logic for that was that I was building a brand and that my priority was marketing and building an audience. So my email list was really important to me. Um, I did not realize how important collaboration would have been back then, but but I did know that building my own credibility would help the book. And that's why I started blogging long before the book uh, ever got written as well. So just indie, indie and Amazon. I did not realize how important collaboration would have been back then, but but I did know that building my own credibility would help the book. And that's why I started blogging long before the book uh, ever got written as well. So just indie, indie and Amazon. Now, I like to refer to you as as the queen of collaboration because you're an amazing collabor collaborator. Like, oh my gosh, 5,000 book sales is, is just incredible. And I know for a lot of authors, there's this big misconception that if you collaborate or partner with another author, it'll distract attention away from your book. So you, you do send tend to see authors shy away from that, where your experience has been the opposite of that. Can you expand upon that for the group, please? Yeah, well, I want to back up and say that an author approached me who read my Lyme disease book and, and asked me if I'd like to co-write another book on Lyme disease. And at the time, I was flattered. And this author, his name is Joey Law, and this is 10 years ago. This is way back. And back then he was doing $10,000 a month in book sales. So he has his own uh, fan following already. And I was a fan of, of his books too. So you'd think that I would have been all, all on this offer of his. And I was just so burnt out. 
at this time because 5,000 book sales is not a lot <laughs> when you factor in the time it took to build up this brand. I mean, seriously, blogging every every other day on forums, trying to get people to connect with me, uh, posting on social media, and I was so burnt out. And if you factor in my my time, my hourly wage was probably pennies, right? So I was, and I was in remission. Um, it was starting to feel like a dream, Lyme disease. And I, so there was a lot, a lot of factors, but I was burnt out from producing so much content. And I also um, was ready to walk away, I guess. So in the end, I said no to this potential collaboration. And I didn't realize how, I didn't even realize that people co-wrote books back then. Um, yeah, so I, looking back, I I kind of wonder what would have happened if I uh, took on this, this project with Joey. And fast forward many years later, because of the, the line book that led me into nerding out um, in marketing, and that led me back to school. So I went to college to take digital marketing, ended up working as a marketer at a few agencies in Toronto. And, and that led me into corporate collaborations. So my, my family business as a toy store ended up being their marketing manager. And some of our collaborations are like, let's get a Toys for Tots bin in the store. And then the local TV and radio stations want to uh, want to get in on the action too because we all serve the same audience. So we're all feeding each other's audience. So I realized in the corporate space how important collaboration is. And then in, during the pandemic, I thought I'm going to give personal branding another go, not with Lyme disease, but with something else. And I, I started... I really built the brand from scratch with collaborations from the beginning. So having my lead magnet ready, knowing who my target audience was, knowing who else serves that target audience, uh, making sure I qualify them by checking to see if they have a lead magnet that's not just a discovery call, but something that they can collect upwards of hundreds of emails, actually opting into the lead magnet to see if it's any good and reaching out to these people and I started a podcast as a nice way to create a slow burn romance with my prospective partners and in the beginning I was interviewing one person uh, every couple of days which is too much I would say that was too much for me but I established a lot of relationships in the indie publishing space relatively quickly uh, with um, hosts of summits in the indie space or author coaches, coaches, editors, other people who serve indie authors. Those were the people I was looking for. So that made building up my email list uh, much easier this time around. It took me two years to get 500 people on my, my um, Lyme disease author list. And I had uh, 5,000 people on my my author list uh, by not even the end of the year. So drastic difference uh, just based on the system that I went with where collaboration was the sustainable factor in marketing versus, okay, let's produce tons of content, fresh new content all the time to keep showing up over and over and over. Um, I switched over to let's build relationships with other people who have relationships <laughs> with lots of people. And um, I wish I knew that back then when Joey reached out to me to co-write a book. You've also had an incredible project this past January. I'm like, was it January? Your author summit? 
Mm -hmm. Right. Can you, can you fill the group in on your author summit? Like, oh my gosh, like this, this girl just has so many incredible passion projects. I'll pass it over to you, Jess, if you can fill us in. Okay. So collaboration, there is like many collaborations, medium size and super size collaborations. The mini one would be cross promotions. So I have the podcast, interview a guest. Most of the time, uh, people, when you stop recording, ask, like, how can I return the favor? And that's where I ask if they'd like to do a newsletter swap. So I promote them, they promote me. Medium-sized collaboration, I've organized um, bundles, so book bundles. Maybe some of you have heard of book funnel or story origin or prolific works where authors get together and easily build these landing pages where they all put their books. Uh, sometimes they're free books, like lead magnets, or sometimes they're, they're just pictures of all their books that lead to different sales pages. And then the big, like the supersized collaboration would be hosting a conference or a summit. And I reached out to uh, hundreds of different people in the indie author space. And in the end, I had 70, 70 collaborators involved in this big project. It was a four day event uh, called Sell Books with Collabs. So mixing my passion for collaboration with, with authors and and I had 12 speakers come in who talked about collaboration uh, in different ways. One of them talked about anthologies. One of them talked about story origin. So one of those software tools where you can collaborate easily. And then we also had, and by, I say we, but it, just, it was just me. Um, I also had 60 other people involved who who donated a digital product or a webinar or something like that as well. And it turned out really great in the end. And all of these collaborators got commission on any sales they brought in. And I made sure the biggest, uh, the biggest factor that made this event a success was making it really easy for collaborators to promote. So writing swipe copy for them, making sure they didn't even need to go look for their affiliate links. I would just add it to their swipe copy and and making sure it's a, an event worth promoting as well. So that, that was great. <laughs> it was exhausting and terrifying. The first day I had 10 sales and I was like, this is going to be horrible. 10 people are going to come for four days to network with each other. But in the end, we had I had 1,100 authors attend the event. And a lot of them said it was the best summit they'd ever been to. There was a lot of networking. So I made sure it was pretty fun. And it was virtual. So no pants required. Congratulations. I mean, that's amazing. That is just amazing. Um, before I ask you about your current projects, because we've talked about Lime. Um, does anyone have any questions for Jess? Oh, here comes Janet. <laughs> yeah. I'm really just interested that you've written a nonfiction piece, and yet you clearly started in fiction um, as, as kind of the thing that drove you to writing. But this is a really different process. Um, mm -hmm. Can you suggest like which one did you enjoy more or or I mean they're are they so totally different you can't even compare them? They're so different. Nonfiction to me is way easier, way easier to write. Yes, you have to do research, but fiction, you have to dig into your soul and expose <laughs> everything about you. I, I so there's a fair bit of soul and exposure in here. I'm like <laughs> there's some. There's there's some, but it's it's different. Like fiction, and I'm exploring. I don't know. It it's just everything. I feel like it, my my one piece of fiction is is me and all the people around me. So I'm also exposing 
you know, my grandma and my friends who I'm merging into different characters. Um, so I don't know. It I've written two other nonfiction books in the last two years. They're just lead magnets um, instead of properly published. But it took me um, a weekend basically to write one of them because it's just my my expertise really versus my fiction, which is a piece of art and every comma matters profoundly to me. It's just a, a different level of care with my fiction. I'll start to... Hi, John. Hi. Um, I was curious about this author's forum. That, um, were they all sort of Canadian local writers? Uh, were they any professionals or iconic writers that are superstars that showed up or uh, really independent uh, indie sort of writers? The summit was, I'd say, 90% indie, indie authors, mm -hmm. but authors who are obsessed with branding and marketing. So a lot of authors who have established email lists and audiences, uh, but not traditionally published. Oh, fascinating. I'm too old to understand. <laughs> it's well, all on paper for me, but yeah. If you have an email list, let's say an email list that opens your emails at 20% open rates um, compared to compared to social media where you might have even more followers, but Facebook, there's a 0.02% engagement rate. Um, that's not even clicks, right? Um, TikTok is a little better. It's four to 18%. Um, Instagram is more like 2%. So your email list is the most engaged audience you generally have, unless you do text marketing, then it's much better. But, but if you're collaborating with other authors, who, who have, you know, I have 5,000 subscribers, you have 5,000. Generally, we both get a 20 to 40% open rate. And 10% of those people will actually opt in to your thing because we have audience overlap. Then you have a good chance of constantly building up your audience. Every time you have a new collab partner, you can build up your audience. So I like it. It's su sustainable marketing. Yeah. And would you would you then use uh, automated mail software like Mailchimp, uh, which would like, offer you up some analytics as well? Or yeah, yeah. So Mailchimp, MailerLite have your lead magnet. In this case, let's say an ebook, uh, and then have an automated email sequence. Let's say you have three emails, an immediate email with a thank you, here's your book, uh, followed by your story or some other gifts. To anything that's going to train your audience to open your emails, not be like, okay, I'm on another list and let's throw this in the junk folder uh, as soon as possible. But uh, having something that's authentic and resonates with the type of person that you want on your list um, is and it's a nice way to use automation, absolutely. And it's a nice way to get people on your list, get them acquainted with you. And then every week, let's say, or every month, uh, you can have a collaboration where you're promoting someone else's book. Let's say you do a book review of their book and here's the link, check it out. I'm not getting anything from this other than this is a cool book that you should check out. They click on the link that you're promoting and then your cloud buddy, same thing, reviews your book, has the link. So you're really cross-pollinating each other's audiences. And, and it's also content. It's regular content for you to send your list. And typically you, you don't even have to write it because your collab partners will have swipe copy for you too. So it's, it's a nice way of building up your list while building up other 
other people as well.